Well, hey friends, welcome to week three of Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, this week, we're gonna look at patterns. I'm Dr. Joel Mutamali, and this is my friend, Lisa Turkhurst. Um, as we look at patterns this week, really what we're gonna unpack is um, how we can find Jesus or see Jesus in those moments where we want to quit. Now, here's the good news. I think, um, well, it's not really good news. It might be bad news. I think we've all wanted to quit at some point in time. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to quit, Lisa? Oh, 100%, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but here's the good news. Uh, and this also isn't kind of good news. It's also a little bit of bad news as well. <laughs> that in the Bible, there's lots of instances of people wanting to quit. But I do have good news. The good news is that even in the midst of wanting to quit, that there's always a reason why we should fight that desire and actually find that we're not left um, helpless in the middle of those moments that we want to quit, that God actually empowers us and helps us to fight through it and to make it onto the other side. Well, and sometimes quitting is good. Like there yeah. are some things that we need to stop in our life. But the children of Israel were marching toward good promises. Yeah. They were marching toward a good promise of God and a purpose of God for them to enter into the promised land and yep. possess that land. So I think the kind of quitting that we're talking about is the kind of quitting where you need to press through because your life is pointed towards something good yeah. and you don't want to stop before you get to God's good. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening for the people of Israel in Exodus chapters 14, 15, and 16. And a quick summary, you know, the people of Israel... Um, have just experienced the, the crazy miraculous goodness of God as he separates the Red Sea and delivers them through it. And then I kind of, I don't know, at least if I'm writing the Bible, we should all be grateful that Joel's not writing the Bible. But <laughs> if I was writing the Bible, I would just be like, here's a highway. It's really great. You can get on an ancient form of a Tesla and just find your way into the promised land, mm -hmm. like short circuit, right? Right, right there. But the text says very explicitly in Exodus chapters 15 and 16 um, that God actually leads them into where? The wilderness. Now, this feels like there's got to be an edit here somewhere. Like, can we undo this and say, no, 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 God leads them to the promised land. But here's the thing. He does lead them to the promised land. The only thing is that in order to get to the promised land, God intentionally leads them through the wilderness. One of the most important prepositions in the Old Testament is the preposition through. It was necessary for the people of Israel to go through the Red Sea, for them to go through their experience in Egypt, and for them to go through the wilderness, because on the other side was the promise that God had for them. But one of the things that I'm so intrigued by is that the text doesn't tell us that God sends them into the wilderness. Because mm -hmm. that would imply that God's in the background being like, all right, y'all just go. Find your way mm -hmm. into there. Like, good luck. Good luck. Like, what meets you meets you. Or that it that the pain of what they're going to experience in the wilderness is pointless. And it's not pointless. That's right. And I think that's one of the most important things to keep in mind this week as we talk about patterns. You know, there's like, I, all of the patterns seem to be hard to good. Mm -hmm. And that implies that there's this middle through time, yes. but there's a point to that middle time. And that's what I think we'll see. This The pattern that we've decided to focus on in the video today is wilderness to promised land, right? right? And like you're saying, but there's a point. And I like to think of it as God is preparing them for the weight of the good. Yeah. In other words, there is going to be a significant weight. You would think just in the wilderness because it's like the the weight of of going through the wilderness and I don't mean weight as in W A I T. I mean there is a burden to the wilderness, but there is also a burden to the blessing. Mm. So God is preparing them in the wilderness to properly handle and be responsible with the burden of the blessing, which is when you get blessed and you enter into the promised land, you may be so tempted to take your eyes off of God and stop depending on God because you've entered into this land flowing with milk and honey. So the burden to the blessing has to be prepared in the hearts of the people that when they get into the promised land, they will not stop depending on God mm. because it's going to be more important than ever for them to keep their hearts depending on him. So part of the way he prepares them for the burden of the blessing is in the burden of the wilderness. Yeah. And 
let me show you something interesting that happened in the wilderness. God is giving the people the preparation because they will need a new way to see him and a new way to walk with him. And God is revealing something new about himself in the wilderness. So, of course, when they get into the wilderness, they absolutely need food, but it's going to be complicated. They're used to living in Egypt. And in Egypt, because of the Nile River and the conditions of what can happen with soil and and even the the, the abundant crops that they were getting in Egypt, when when they go into the wilderness, they cannot look down and expect that the ground is going to give them food like it gave them in Egypt. Yep. They've got to start looking up and recognizing that ultimately their provision comes from God. Right. For years in Egypt, they were looking down at the ground. Now God is going to take them through the wilderness and teach them their provision, their hope, their future depends on God. So God is literally lifting their head and teaching them through the daily need for food to keep their eyes on him. How does he do that? Well, instead of providing food from the ground in the wilderness, God provides food that falls from heaven. Look at Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse four. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven. Heaven. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day, which means it's a daily adventure. And I love that the leaves are falling right now because it's like, <laughs> oh, things are falling from heaven, from heaven. <laughs> or at least from the trees. Um, but I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough just for that day. Yeah. In other words, daily dependence on God. Mm-hmm was part of the purpose of the manna, not just to feed the people, but to teach the people through their daily need of food, Mm -hmm. that every day they're going to go out and they are to depend on God and look to God for their supply. And in this way, God says, I will test them Mm -hmm. and see whether they will follow my instructions. So important. And then it says on the sixth day that to prepare what they bring in and that will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So only on the sixth day were they allowed to gather twice as much. Before then, if they went out on any other day and gathered twice as much so that they wouldn't have to go outside and look up to God, then the food would rot. Would rot. And so it's this beautiful way of of God showing them physically what they also needed to remember spiritually and on that sixth day the reason why they had to gather double is because the seventh day is a day of rest the sabbath exactly and so this is again i just love that that little note in there that we can miss that this is one of the ways that the lord is going to test his people to do exactly what he says nothing less than and nothing more than and this lesson was so crucial and it was it was absolutely essential for the israelites to learn it And so God wove it into the pattern of their daily life, not just for that generation, but it was for 40 years. Yes. And so it extended past this generation to the the next next generation so that it would be a lasting daily dependence on God. Look at Genesis or Exodus 16, verse 35. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to the land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. Mm, that's so good. Lisa, there's one little detail here that I want us to go back to. Joel always has one little detail. I just have one little detail. And I think <clears throat> this one's a really important detail because sometimes it's easy for us to read these pas- passages of scripture and just kind of like point our fingers and be like, you Israelites, how oh. could you? Like there is bread flying coming down from heaven to yeah. you. As if we would <laughs> as if we would handle this better. As if we would handle right? now, here's here's the indication of what's actually taking place in the text. Acts starts in verse three, and this is uh I'm gonna start in verse two. Exodus sixteen, verse two. The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled oh. against Moses and Aaron in yes. the wilderness. Y'all, Aaron and Moses did not have an easy job. I, I'm not signing up for their role. And then this is what it says. And the people of Israel said to them, this is all in quotations, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full 
for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Y'all, reality check. Just one second. The people of Israel in Egypt, they sit by campfires with meat pots that have meat brimming to the top with bread all around them. Like, yeah, they're looking back. <laughs> and I remember this song. Um, I think it was Sarah Grove sang it. And, and it was called um, Painting Pictures of Egypt. In other words, sometimes when we go, God, God answers our prayer. And this was a prayer of the Israelites. God, mm -hmm. deliver us. God, deliver us. And so God did. But now they get into the in-between spot on their way to Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. honey. And they start complaining and painting pictures of Egypt as if Egypt, going back to Egypt would have been better. And Egypt was the very thing they were begging God to deliver them from. And I, I love that you're pointing this out, Joel, as we study patterns this week and seeing Jesus in the Old Testament through patterns and seeing the presence of Jesus. Remember, what was this, this manna from heaven? It was bread. bread. And the people knew that it was bread. And the scriptures go on to say later in Exodus 16 that this bread from heaven was coriander, right. like little coriander seeds that were sweetened with honey, yeah. right? Well, when we finally get to the New Testament, we see Jesus is the bread of life. Bread of life. So, Joel, my question is, how do we see Jesus in the Old Testament here? Yeah, I mean, easily we see Jesus as being the provider of the bread. The yeah. same bread that sustained the people of Israel through their wilderness wandering. God would find it so good that he would send Jesus himself. And the same with the bread came down from heaven onto earth. The bread of life, Jesus himself, came from the perfection of heaven onto earth to satisfy a type of hunger that could never be satisfied in humanity, a spiritual hunger that is just yearning and longing that can only be met by the Messiah, Jesus himself. Yeah, because physical bread can only reach the depth of our stomach. But the bread of life through Jesus reaches the depth of our soul and gives us satisfaction where we would never be able to get satisfaction apart from Jesus. Yeah, I think, Lisa, one of the things that's also happening here is there is a long-term vision of discipline that the Lord wants to teach the Israelites. God sits outside of time and he knows exactly when the Messiah was going to come. And this idea of being faithful in the middle of their wilderness experience was a, um, a lesson that needed to be learned, not just for that generation, but for every generation to come, for our generation, and for every generation that comes after us. Mm. And one of the things that seems to be one of the most important aspects of seeing Jesus uh, in the middle of those moments when we want to quit, in the middle of those wilderness moments, is to recognize that there is not a moment that is wasted with God. Mm. There's not an experience that is wasted with God. That he is, just like Roman says, he's working out all things together for the good of those that love him and that do according to his word. And so um, maybe the encouragement for us today, if you're in that wilderness moment, you're at that moment, you're like ready to throw up your hands and say, I think I'm done. I'm outie. I, I just, I want to quit. Maybe we can again take a step back and just wonder, what is this area that the Lord wants to refine in us, that he wants to teach us, that he wants us to practice our faithfulness? Because if we can be faithful in our wilderness moments, what an incredible opportunity to practice that same faithfulness when God leads us into the promised land. And I love that it says that God provided the manna until they stepped right to the border of Canaan. In other words, I think the thing that should encourage us not to quit is the reality that God will see us through and Jesus' presence is with us. Just like we see Jesus in the Old Testament, we will see him in our lives as well.